Hi, my name is Dr. Mary Larjani, and welcome to Skin the Surface. We'll address important topics related to your skin. This show is intended to serve as an educational resource for members of our community. Our hope is that we encourage you to take a more active role in your skin health. We do provide any personal medical advice. So if you feel like any of the issues we discuss apply to you, and we hope that many of them do, we recommend that you consult with your board certified dermatologist for more information. In our last episode, you learned all there is to know about cancer. Today, we will transition our discussion to skin cancer prevention and talk about what we can eat to do to minimize our risk of developing skin cancer. We will discuss protective strategies that have been shown to lower your risk of developing skin cancer. And we're also going to dive into the very heated debate on sunscreen and sunscreen absorption that has recently been seen in the news. To help me discuss this, I am joined by a member of our local community, Dr. Aram Elias, via Zoom as we're maintaining social distancing during this COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Elias is a board-certified dermatologist and the founder of Montgomery Dermatology, a practice, a local practice in the King area where she has cared for patients for over 10 years. In addition, Dr. Elias is the founder of Amber Noon, a sun-safe brand whose products include UV protective clothing as well as sunscreen. Flagship store is just around the corner in Google Village. Welcome, Dr. Elias. Hi, thank you for having me this morning. Thank you for joining us. So let's dive right into it. So we know that protecting skin from the sun can reduce your risk of skin cancer, sunburn, and premature aging. According to the American Academy of Dermatology, one in five Americans will develop skin cancer in their lifetime. Um, and this can occur from intermittent sun exposure throughout one's lifetime or even a blistering sunburn. Um, in fact, just one blistering sunburn during childhood or adolescence has been shown to nearly double a patient's chance of developing melanoma. So Dr. Elias, can you tell our viewers a little bit more about the different ways that we can protect ourselves from the damaging effects of the sun? Absolutely. I tend to think of sun safety as a basically a plan. There's four major components to protecting our skin. Think of it as having hats, sunglasses, clothing, as well as sunscreen products. By utilizing all four of those products, that there are ways that we can protect every inch of our body surface area adequately from the sun. That's great. I love that visual. That's a really great one for patients to imagine. So um, for the purposes of today's episode, I really want to focus in on those measures that you mentioned, the sunscreen and the protective clothing. So to start with sunscreen. So most people actually don't realize that not all sunscreen works the same way. Can you tell us a little bit more about the different types of sunscreen available to us? You know, I try to explain it to patients as there's two major categories of sunscreen. There are physical sunblocks and chemical sunscreens. Mm -hmm. Chemical sunscreens are what we majority the majority of the sunscreens out there are. They tend to have pro ingredients in them that absorb UV light, but they have a maximal absorption they can get to. Once they hit that maximum absorption quality, the rest of the UV actually spills right over to the to your skin and can result in a sunburn if you're out there long enough. Those are the times when you say, "I wore my sunscreen. I was doing everything I was supposed to do, but why did I still get a sunburn?" The physical sunblocks, which would be the ingredients that most people are familiar with terms like zinc or titanium, those are great ingredients because they physically block your skin from sun exposure or UV light. By wearing those, you get a, a larger sense of security that your skin is adequately protected regardless of the circumstance. That's great. Um, and so, you know, with so many sunscreen brands out there, how do you know if the sunscreen you purchase is adequately protecting your skin? This is where I tell people don't shop for sunscreen based on the front of the label or the price tag. You really want to look for sunscreen based on the ingredients in the back of the label. That's when you basically look at every bottle, turn it around, look for the active ingredients. Look for zinc and or titanium as the ingredients because then you can have a much better sense of security that that product will protect your skin. It, I always have to caution patients though. We we did a large study in this area in King of Prussia where I had my students go out and check all of our stores and actually list every sunscreen they could find and all the ingredients. They're not easy to find. It was less than 12% of sunscreens in our area only had mineral, mineral sunscreen ingredients. And it worries me because I think a lot of times we assume what we get is gonna be okay. You just can't trust words like broad spectrum um, or mineral-based sunscreen because a lot of times they may have other ingredients, the chemical sunscreens, and you may not get that full protection you're looking for. 
Yeah, that's so important. It's not, advertising can be some false advertising sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so moving along um, to another very common question that patients will ask us, um, how much sunscreen should we be using and how often should we be reapplying it? Where it all depends on how adequately you're utilizing every aspect of that sun safety plan. The average sort of person will probably use about one ounce of sunscreen a day if they're wearing your standard sun summer clothing, you know, shorts and t-shirts or, or what have you, where most of your arms and legs are exposed. One ounce, which is about a shot glass full of sunscreen, should adequately cover your arms, your legs, your face, all those exposed areas. But if you were to be careful to utilize sun protective clothing, hats, and sunglasses, you could actually reduce the quantity of sunscreen you have to use. Yeah, that's really important because I actually did that experiment myself where I took a shot glass and I filled it up with sunscreen. And believe it or not, I took the entire bottle of uh, sunscreen to fill up that. So that's great uh, advice that we can kind of supplement that with the clothing that we're wearing. And we're going to get into a little bit more of that too as well. Um, Another important thing I want to address is the vehicle. So does the vehicle of sunscreen make a difference? For instance, are creams better than sunscreen sprays or sunscreen sticks? That's a great question. You know, the FDA approval process is such that if there's an SPF listed on the label, regardless if it's a cream, lotion, or spray, that you can trust that that SPF is going to be there in that product, regardless of the vehicle. However, I will say that when we went out and looked for physical sunscreens on the market, it was pretty rare to find mineral sunscreens in a spray version. The reason is a practical version. They tend to be a little bit um, of a heavier product, and they just you clog the nozzle, so they don't tend to be stable in those bottles for that reason. But they just don't get spray easily. Um, so chances are, if you have an aerosolized sunscreen, there's a good chance that it's a chemical sunscreen. Mm-hmm. Good to be mindful of those factors. Yeah, definitely. And definitely not something you want to try to be spraying on a windy day on the beach because that will definitely not go where you intend. Um, Another question I wanted to address is what types of sunscreens are safe for infants and for children? So the general recommendation is under the age of six months, it's probably better to just avoid the sun. Try to avoid direct exposure to UV light just to not put yourself at risk for a sunburn, but also not at risk for that smaller body surface area of being covered by sunscreen and not knowing the implications of that. For children, we do tend to recommend the mineral-based sunscreens because there have been recent studies that have inconclusive data as to what the absorption of chemical sunscreens into our bloodstream can mean long-term. It's really hard to say what it means. We just know that we do absorb them. So it's probably best to stick with the physical sunscreens because they're generally recognized as safe. Yeah, that's great. That's actually was going to be my follow-up question to you. So what you were mentioning is those recent um, reports that we're actually absorbing some of the chemical sunscreen ingredients at higher levels than the FDA previously thought. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people have understandably become concerned. Um, so is there anything to say at this time that these chemical absorptions cause any known problems to patients? That's a great question. It's really hard to say because they're still being studied. Um, And that's what the FDA, the reason these studies have been coming out is because the FDA has requested more safety data and better studies to evaluate the implications of absorption. The theory is that they could be endocrine disruptors, which means they can uh, interfere with our endocrine system, which of course during puberty or for pregnant women, this can be an issue. We just don't know enough to know if that's true. And so that's why we tend to say, given the uncertainty, it may be better to be mindful of your purchase because we do have alternative ingredients to choose from. Yeah. And I think what we keep harping back to is that um, we do love sunscreen as dermatologists. And when in doubt, the mineral ones are probably the most effective and the safest. That we know of. Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. Um, Well, let's transition into a topic that I'm sure you're very excited to talk about, and that is UV protective clothing. So can you tell um, the listeners a little bit more about how you came to develop your own UV protective clothing line? Absolutely. You know, it's been after years of seeing patients and seeing the struggles that they face in terms of finding adequate ways to protect their skin from UV exposure. I know that they're well-intentioned. There's options out there. Um, and what I found is even though I recommend sun protective clothing, what I really discovered when I went out to look at what was available is that aside from the fact that most of the available items were athletic wear, athleisure wear, it really was kind of frustrating for people to find everyday wear. 
And I took it a step further because of all these chemical sunscreen questions. I started to wonder what actually made the clothing sun protective in the first place. And what I discovered is that most companies use UV chemical finishes to achieve sun protection. And I felt like, you know, this is another issue. You know, this is where my patients get frustrated a safe option and having enough studies out there to say what does that mean for our health or the environment to have another UV chemical finish in our clothing that we put on our body. So I studied it further and I was able to prove that there's no need for a UV chemical finish. If the quality of the construction of the textiles was sound, it could sustain the exact same standards, you know, protecting our skin with a UPF of 50 plus before and after 40 washes, which is the industry standard. Wonderful. So yeah, so that has leads me to some follow-up questions. So um, really briefly, can you tell the viewers a little bit more about what a UV protective factor really means and how that kind of equates with an SPF? So UPF, I think, is a much better factor for understanding the implications of UV exposure to our skin. It takes into account both UVA and UVB rays. UVB, I think of it as B, means burn in some ways, where you can think of that way, where it's really the factor that SPF is telling us about maybe the likelihood to burn and maybe the risk of skin cancer. UVA is included in the UPF calculation without SPF calculation. The frustration there is UVA can damage the skin deeper and thin the skin over time. And even though it may not be linked to skin cancer directly, it may, we're starting to think it may be indirectly so by thinning skin prematurely and putting our skin at higher risk for the UVB it's exposed to. The two go hand in hand though. It's not that the sun emits one ray at one time. Both are coming out. So I think of it as we need to be mindful of both. And that's where I find SPF can be a little frustrating to understand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, and so just to dive in a little bit more into what you were speaking of before, what are the qualities of clothing that make them sun safe? Is it the fabric? Is it the fit? Is it the color? All of those factors can play a role. Ultimately, I try to focus more on the fabric itself and making sure that it can sustain that UV protection. However, the color can play a role. So if you have a t-shirt, for example, that's never been made for the purposes of sun safety and you go out and test it, a white t-shirt has an UPF of maybe three to seven in most studies. If you get a black t-shirt or a green t-shirt or something of a darker color, it definitely has better quality. It can get as high as an 11 or a 12. But without that added look at the quality of the construction of the textile, you're losing out on that added protection where you can get over a UPF of 20, 30, 40, or 50. So we try to say that every aspect of it does matter. Okay. And are there certain like types of fabrics that people should pick? Um, like is cotton better than polyester? Um, you know, it's interesting. I've studied every variation of textile out there. What I find is that the mixed blend are usually a safer choice if you're choosing something that has not been tested. Something with a little bit of a spandex element of it will pull those fibers together tighter, so they're more likely to protect your skin from UV. Um, whereas cotton by itself, polyester by itself, linen by itself, they don't tend to alone protect the skin adequately from the sun. They really only get into that UPF of five to 10. Um, once you add a little bit of a spandex element, you bump up your UV protection. And then of course, if it's been tested and studied and they've actually taken the efforts to look for it, you'll find that UPS can get even higher. Okay, that's great. Um, and then one other question I wanted to ask you today, um, which you already touched on a little bit, is that does washing your clothing affect its UV protective factor? So this is where I found some interesting and so the, we put our clothing through 40 washes because of the industry standard. The reason that standard is there is because the theory is that if you put a chemical finish on a textile, it will wash off over time. So because of that UV chemical finish coming out into the wash, there's a chance it'll lose its protective qualities over time. However, if you take a regular T-shirt and that hasn't been studied, it loses a little bit of UPF, not a lot or based on the wear and tear, how much that fabric is put there the user. So you can think of children that are rough and tumble out there and really uh, ripping up their clothing, that's going to lose its UPF protection, um, but it's really over time, not in those first 10 probably. Okay, that's great. 
That's such great information. Thank you so much. Um, I really want to thank you, Dr. Ilias, for joining us today and sharing all your wisdom on the ways that we can make sun safe changes in our day-to-day lives that are going to have lasting effects on your overall skin health. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. Of course. Um, well, that's all we have for today. Thanks for joining in today's discussion about your skin. We hope you learned something new. If you like what you heard today, tune into our Skin the Surface podcast available on iTunes and Spotify or visit us online at skinthesurfacepod.com. See you next time.